Welcome to Dangerous Policy. I'm Charlene. I'm Crispin. And Dangerous Policy is a platform aimed at intelligent people where we discuss important issues facing life and society. This is our week in review. And this is the third time we've done our week in review. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we all have our bugbears uh, when it comes to the production value, right? So we, we there are things that I just can't deal if things are not right. Uh, and Charlene's big bugbear is if something is out of focus. Oh, absolutely. It's not even a little bit, though, because I can fix a little bit, right? There's, like, tricks on Premiere Pro that you can, like, uh, I mean, like, people will be able to see it, it's out of focus, but we not that bad. Mm. But the stuff that we did for Week in Review is just unwatchable. <laughs> Like, you can't see our face. So, yeah, that is All my right. bugbear. So hopefully, yeah, ho third time's a charm. Yes. And if it doesn't work, you can play Crispin. <laughs> How's your week, Crispin? Oh, it's been, it's been excellent. We've had, yeah. uh, obviously, Easter, and mm -hmm. uh, my friend wanted to go out on his boat, which was really nice. Uh, yeah. We went, you know, down the, this entire river, mm -hmm. out to the ocean, uh, so that was good. Uh, weather is changing, so uh, the, you know it's gone from oppressively hot to now fully autumn. Is it? It still feels oppressively hot. Oh well, it's but it's not not the same level. It's certainly not like just five days of plus forty degree heat again, yeah. where it, it's all you know, crushingly burning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, otherwise, yeah, life's yeah. life's pretty good. Um, yeah. Look, Crispin fails to mention he wanted a boat. He had. Like forty drinks <laughs> and well, a lot of alcohol. Well, yeah, but that's you know that's an Australian thing to do. I, it's it, not an Australian thing to it do. It is. No, yeah. no. I, <laughs> <laughs> like this is where we disagree. I'm just gonna. Okay. Like. okay. So, uh, as well as you actually, I did mention it in the in the video um, on shaming, and Charlene is uh, good at pointing out uh, things that she sees as shameful. The, the thing is, it's just so counterproductive to your goals, right? You want to lose mm. weight, mm -hmm. come out healthier, look younger, or, you know, look better than you were before. And alcohol just annihilates that. There's no point. Like, it just... Okay, so for clarity, <laughs> uh, this happened before I recorded that video. So it's not like it's not like I made that commitment and then went and had a big drinking binge. This, this happened beforehand. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you're right. I mean... The, there's different cultures towards drinking around the world. So, for example, uh, I don't think the Italians or the French drink significantly less than we do, but the mm. culture is markedly different. You know, you're, you're drinking wine with food, uh, or if you're, for example, in the Balkans, uh, you'll have your, you know, rakia with, with salad. Uh, mm. And then even if you're in the United States, the, the bar culture in the United States is far more civilised than what you get here in Australia. So you'll go to the bar... You'll speak to the bar staff. You'll sit on a chair. You'll talk to the people next to you. You'll drink fairly gradually. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you know you'll be perfectly fine when yeah. you're walking out the door. In Australia, people do drink to get smashed, and they do it very very hard. So uh, yeah, it is uh, there is a binge culture uh, in Australia, and it, it, I think it does ex lend to excuse fairly poor behaviour. Mm. Most Australians. I think don't judge people drinking much. They'll they'll judge people the way they behave when they are drinking. So so the judgment as to whether or not someone drinks too much isn't oh it's unhealthy for them, mm. uh, but rather they can't handle their alcohol. That's the that's the main criticism I think socially. Mm. Uh, and if someone is drinking to the point where they're boorish and they're upsetting other people, and mm. uh, that's when people start to think that they have a, a problem. So uh, one of the reasons why. Uh, I can, you know, drink uh, a bit too much uh, from time to time is because, you know, I feel like I'm a fairly casual drunk. You know, I, I, I'm very friendly with people. I don't, uh, I don't really do anything too embarrassing. Um, but, you know, mm. it's not true for. I've heard some people like lose friends if they stop, like, say they're in social circle that regularly drink, and they're like, when they've chosen not to drink, like their mates are like, "Well, you can't hang with us," which is such a stupid thing, but it is like part of the culture i don't know my friendship says that we don't really care about like you can drink you don't have to drink but some people like it's so entrenched in like what they do it's like how come you're not having a drink and then they feel alienated for not drinking i don't know if that's an australian thing um yeah, yeah i think it is uh, and i mean in my own circle of friends like it's strange i, I would drink the least 
out of my friends. Even even my female friends tend to drink more than I do. And I drink a lot, right? Um, certainly more compared to Charlene. Uh, Mine's and, lemon lime bitters. <laughs> Best yeah. drink. No alcohol. <laughs> uh, and, and it's true that, like, if people, if there's one person in the group, the circle, that's not drinking, then they do seem like, you know, the old one out. But I don't think there's too much, you know, there's not, there's not much pressure in our groups to mm. drink. Um, it's just yeah. the environment in which you're immersed. Uh, and the, the problem with what makes you the old one out isn't so much if you go to dinner and, and you're drinking like the water or the, or the lemonade while everyone else is having a glass of wine. It's more if you're going out clubbing or partying mm. or on a boat. Uh, where everyone else is getting progressively sozzled uh, mm. and you, you know, you're still completely sober, mm. uh, then it's hard to relate to the other people on the boat, mm. you know, or, or in your club or whatever. So uh, yeah. it's not so much the social pressure of, uh, you know, being being peer pressured into drinking. It's, it's more uh, feeling left out because you're no longer connected to people on their wavelength because you're not drinking with them. Mm. engaging and so you can it can really break down the communication yeah uh but yeah. it's true that that we do we do drink too much and this is one of those things that we don't uh we're not honest about in australia uh there, there's the people cling to the you know a moderate amount of wine being healthy and like, all of this sort of stuff um but uh just on alcohol so i was prophetic uh, last year i I did a uh, a video where I men mention of the fact that the way in which our kind of uh, ideology culture is going, uh, people will start complaining that the the recommended daily intake of alcohol between men and women, given it it's different, uh, would be considered unfair or anti women. Uh, and what have they done? Oh, they've just said it, all, all Australian adults not recommended like four, more than four standard drinks. Yes. So they've just standardized it across the board, no matter what your sex is. Which I guess, like, yeah, like from your perspective, oh my God, I'm a prophetic person. But like at the same time, now thinking about it, if the trend is upwards and people are drinking more, then they might as well, oh, like, let's just make it easy for everybody. But that's, it's not, they've, they've made a decision that's anti science, but Pope pro-politics right mm. like if, if they're saying okay it, it should because the science is your blood alcohol level yeah right? yeah um and when they say you know a man shouldn't drink more than two drinks within the hour mm. what they're saying is his blood alcohol level will exceed the safe limit for driving or the, or the tolerance for driving uh and they say well a, a woman shouldn't drink more than one in the hour for the same reason because yeah. the blood alcohol level increases so th th there was a scientific basis for the recommendation for which the health recommendation is built on top of that yeah uh, the the change isn't motivated by even simplicity it's motivated to to say that they don't want to prejudice against women yeah or they um, just want to prejudice against those who don't <laughs> i don't i actually have no idea there was no like when i looked into it there was no like just Justification of why the change happened. It just updated. Why? Yeah, why? <laughs> yeah, and, but, but, but because if we were to introduce something like that today, let's say there was no recommended health intake for alcohol consumption, mm. uh, and you were to introduce one today, well, yeah. of course you would make it equal between males and females, no matter what the science dictated, because mm. of the politics. Uh, to do anything that would create a distinction between the two sexes as sort of an anathema to our political discourse today, which is uh, fine when when that differential creates undue harm, but when it's based on just biological facts, um, I think it's a bit silly. But I was, I mean, the point of this story is that I am feeling prophetic about the fact that I predicted that this would happen because of the direction of our yeah. politics. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All good. Okay, so given that you want to lose weight, let's discuss why alcohol is counterproductive to that. <laughs> so you know how energy, how we get energy from our bodies, right? Yeah. So we eat food or we get it from our fat, right? And it goes through a great cycle called um, the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Mm -hmm. Here's a bio biology for you. So what alcohol does, it produces basically it's, what, what is it? Ethanol. Ethanol then produces uh acetyl i have notes <laughs> charlie's prepared <laughs> she's like you're being schooled <laughs> so i had this binge drinking session 
And as you can see, I have never let it. This is this is like two and a half days ago. Oh is, my god! It just it honestly breaks my heart like that people could drink so much because our liver is so important to us, man. Like it's the thing that keeps all the toxins out. So anyway, so in your liver, you obviously have these liver cells, and so ethanol, right? It's based on ethanol gets converted into your liver. Your liver's like this is poisonous. So that's essentially acetaldehyde. I can't say that. Anyway, What's that's the a word. As, as, that, acetaldehyde. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Either. Yeah, it's, it's a really toxic substance, right? Mm-hmm. That's converted into your liver. Your liver's like, look, I've got to stop processing all that energy from your food, from your fat, and I need to freaking get this toxin out. Mm-hmm. Firstly, so as a so it stops the the citric acid cycle. Mm-hmm. And then it converts that toxic substance to acetate, which is a neutral substance. And that acetate can either go into the citric acid cycle, it can either go into fat synthesis, mm-hmm. or it can either go to cholesterol building. Okay. So if you think about your lifestyle and when you tend to drink, you're not jumping around and doing lots of exercise that you need to, you know, increase your energy, right? To output. So what's it going to do? The easiest way to get all the toxins out, and obviously there's a concentration, so you want to equalize the concentration, it's going to convert to fat. And by the time, once it's all converted to fat or what's all, you know, tries to be processed properly, then the food they've eaten during the day, so all that fatty, I don't know, um, delicious, what are they, like, burrito, not burrito. What are they called? Kebabs? Kebabs mm-hmm. that you're like hell craving after a really like hard night out partying. That won't get processed until probably like 24 hours afterwards once all that alcohol is being processed and detoxified out of your body. So that's why it's so easy to gain weight <laughs> when you drink alcohol because you're basically telling your body, I'm going to stop, you know, um, getting using my energy that I got from my food. I'm going to stop breaking down the fat in my body and I need to use all of that, uh, all my body body systems to process that alcohol first. Yeah. So here's some school for thought. Like. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a good segue into uh, shaming, right? Because, because Charlene has expressed significant disappointment with my behaviour. Oh, 40 drinks. Oh, God. <laughs> well, it's... Over a long period of time, this is like twenty-four like, hours. I don't think so. Hours. Yeah, yeah, but it is like it's. It's not like we. Yeah, you know, I went out and just just sculled a bottle of vodka or something. This is this uh, is this was the full day's uh, extravaganza. Uh, According and, to guidelines, it's very different. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and she's pointing out how it's you know obviously very unhealthy, counterproductive to my to your goals to my goals. Uh, that it is a product often of socialization that I have to then, you know, question is, is what are the underlying reasons for, for engaging that in activity? Uh, and what, you know, noticeable consequences, obviously, for my, um, you know, body fat processing and so on, but also uh, what does it mean for my productivity in other areas? So these are all, I think, perfectly fair. Now, what she could say is, oh, you know, you don't drink that much and, and, uh, and drinking's fine. You should be proud of your drinking. I don't think anyone should be proud of their drinking. <laughs> like, but but that but if but this is the weird thing. If we talk about obesity, for example, uh, people will say, "Oh, everyone comes in all shapes and sizes, and everyone has their own predilections." And you do you. you should feel good about like you know the way you consume your calories or whatever. This is a, this is a truly like you know a common thing that happens. So you're you're sitting there now shaming me for my alcohol experience. Uh, no, we're not shaming you because it's so no, counterproductive to your goal. But but this is the thing, as as my video would say, I think this is an extraordinarily important point, right? You're shaming me because you care about my well being. You want what's right. best for me. You want me to make better life decisions, not just because you feel like it's a bit of a silly thing to do, but also because you think it would be beneficial for me to do those things. And because you want what's best for me, you're giving me this feedback based not on your own expertise as a, as a health promotion specialist. Uh, and, uh, and as someone who lives in the same culture and society that I do without having the same 
uh, you know, alcohol permissive environment, which is, uh, I, I think, an entirely appropriate thing to do as a friend. And and I don't feel bad because of it. I feel obviously embarrassed because I'm being shamed and I'm being shamed, you know, before my, my global audience. Um, but uh, it's, it, I think it's appropriate. I think if, if you if you say something to uh, someone else that you feel is in their best interest, now obviously there's a limit there. Like you, know, right. you, know, if, you wouldn't go up to a stranger. I wouldn't say this to a stranger. Real, actually, I'll tell the science to a stranger, but I wouldn't make it personal because mm. I know you. I could easily make it personal, <laughs> and I know you could take it. <laughs> Whereas other people, I wouldn't be able to. I'll just tell them the process that article gets processed, and they'll have to self reflect. Mm. Whether they take it on or not, it's up to them. But like, at least they know. Like, and I, I think I think that stigmatization is a damn sight better than permissiveness, right? Okay? Uh, and therefore, we, we should be far less uh, permissive towards things that we know on a, on a global societal population level to be terrible life choices. Like vaping. <laughs> Going. Well, well, the evidence isn't out on vaping, and, and 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 that's a matter of comparison, right? Like, yeah, you know, is it are you comparing vaping to someone who doesn't smoke anything at all, or you or you're comparing vaping to people that are smoking? And so that's that's a different different story. Um, but in this case, uh, you know, it's drinking is part of the Australian culture, uh, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with stigmatizing the binge elements. I mean, I, I personally don't have a problem, with, obviously don't have a problem drinking in a healthy range. And I think that it's a social lubricant has a lot of benefits. If it didn't have benefits, people wouldn't do it. Um, and unlike, you know, cigarette smoking, for example, there is, a, I think, a fairly healthy, safe level of alcohol consumption, mm. um, which can be consumed as part of any sort of normal diet or culture. But I do, I do think that, and I might do a whole video on Australian drinking culture um, now that I think about it, because it is significantly worse than the drinking cultures of other cultures. Even even countries that drink more than we do, I think have a better way of managing it, that like the societal norms and culture that's built up around it. Australia's got a very anything goes mentality, which yeah. means that you just drink as much as possible whenever you know, whatever time of day it doesn't yeah. really matter. I remember like Melbourne celebrated their like out of lockdown with have a beer. Like that was the first thing that they said. Let's go to the pub and have a beer. <laughs> well, but to be fair, I mean, and and I would actually defend that to an extent. Like publicans, like like these these restaurants, these businesses would have suffered. Oh yeah, immensely. but like yeah, but they have a meal. Like it's it's just so it's like so colloquial. Like just to say it without True. even yeah mm. no. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And so, I mean, the the, the point of, of my obesity video, and, and I was extraordinarily harsh in what I said, but I, I'm hopeful that, you know, I can hold myself to the same standard in that respect. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, yeah, so camera cut out, but uh, the point is uh, what I want to get away from is encouragement and permissiveness of the greatest health crisis that the world faces which is obesity uh, what tends to happen is that if you have hundreds of millions of people billions of people around the world becoming obese mm. then they stop to be an abnormality in the minds of many people but actually a constituency people go all right well, we have to pander to their predilections mm. in order to get elected in order to get support uh, and there's a general uh, sense out there and this comes from a good place this is a good well-meaning thing that people want other people to feel good a lot of people will see someone who's obese and say well obviously this person doesn't feel great about themselves because they're overweight they might have serious depression mental illness things that are contributing to their eating lifestyle uh, and therefore they don't want to shame them because they think that that would be counterproductive because they're not shaming the fact that that person is obese they're shaming the individual uh, and and that is a different thing right if you, if you feel that you're obese not because you've let yourself go or you're overweight because you've mm. let yourself go if you think that you're overweight and obese because there's something wrong with you fundamentally then shaming yeah. you may not be the most effective response mm. but for the vast majority i think just having people who care about you saying hey you know just just shape up um that is appropriate you need that negative feedback because you yourself know 
that uh, that that's important. And what happens is it just drops down the list of priorities. Not many people uh, have much time. We're all kind of time poor. We have a lot of competing commitments. Uh, and so losing weight might be, you know, fifth or sixth on my priority list. Easy mm. to drop that off, particularly on any given day because it requires constant attention. Mm. Uh, and thus uh, it's, it, it requires the external feedback for people, for you to kind of realise, oh, no, I'm going to bump that up the list of my priorities because, you know, mm. other people clearly notice. Uh, right. And that's, uh, yeah, and I think that's true for the majority of people. So my, my two goals are, uh, well, three. One, uh, hold myself to account. Um, for the I'll help. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, uh, what, hold myself to account. Uh, number two, give the advice to people that do need that motivation. And three, uh, to combat the kind of fat positivity, larger mm. letter, bigger idea that's now kind of infecting our culture because of the extraordinary health consequences that come mm. with that attitude. Just as Charlene's attitude about, uh, you know, binge alcohol consumption, uh, it, the, Australia has a very permissive attitude towards that. And, and I'm sure, uh, as Charlene has said, we, we pay a high price for that. Um, and if we didn't have such a permissive attitude towards alcohol, if alcohol consumption wasn't considered as normal as it is, uh, then people would be less likely to drink to excess. Um, mm, mm, yeah. Yeah, I had a it when I was listening to the video about obesity because I work in the fitness industry as well, um, and I teach classes. Like I get people of all shapes and sizes come to my class, and and when I see you know people who are overweight and obese, like and they've come for the first time, there there are so many different factors that brought them there, right? And your my goal as a fitness as a good fitness professional is to make sure that they're motivated and they'll come next week. Because mm -hmm. I know that, you know, if they build the confidence, they'll become and make it a regular habit and then they'll stick to it and they'll achieve their goals, right? And I don't – so I have to be very conscious of their motivations and, like, yeah, how do I keep them there and how do I make them feel inclusive and not feel isolated? Because a lot of the people in my class is tough. So uh, you, the first time you do my class, like, you are going to be sore the next day. You might feel so unfit and unwell and you're like, why did I even put myself through this? So it's kind of like, yeah, like – Yes, it's one message, definitely, like to tell people, you know, we should normalize this behavior of being overweight and obese. Like, you know, it, there is a lot of complications with gaining a significant amount of weight you know, and we shouldn't be like, it's beautiful because there's just, you're going to put more harm than good, right? Like, like biologically, yes. Um, but, you know, is it the one way to go? It's Perhaps, perhaps the uh, solution or, or the, the right outcome is not to shame someone for where they're at, but shame behaviours, okay? So uh, if someone happens to be obese, well, well, you're not supposed to compare yourself to the fittest person at the gym uh, or, or the craziest, you know, like athlete junkie out there. What you're supposed to do is compare yourself today to where you were yesterday. Are yeah. you further along in your journey? Yeah. Uh, and... What, and then when you're making decisions today, what would future you say about them if they if they had a say? Uh, and so when if someone happens to be overweight, it's not shaming them for being overweight, although it might be helpful to remind them if they hadn't thought about it. Uh, but also if they're engaging in activities that exacerbate that problem, that's what you target. You target the behavior and say, look, you know, you're eating too much cheesecake or or, <laughs> or, or you're drinking too much. Um, mm. And thus, uh, that's what you go after. Mm. But that requires, you know, obviously a personalised message, which, you know, hard to present in a, in a video like this. But Yeah, you need to really know the person because I know some people who have, like, you know, provide advice to their friends about, look, I think you shouldn't drink this or whatever because I think it's a lot of calories. They isolate this one thing and it's, it's, it's crazy, right? They're like, no carbs for you. Or something just random. And it's just crazy. I'm just like, that's not how you do it. <laughs> but yeah, and then it, they call the fight between each other and they don't trust it. Like you have to do it in a way that can't share with compassion, right? Because you want to, again, have the best intentions for this person and you have to really understand their language and that takes time. Like, it really takes time. Um, and if you do it well, then, yeah, you'll get the message across more effectively. Otherwise, people will just feel like, I don't know what you're talking about, like, kind of thing. Or they'll feel a bit more, you know, standoffish. So, 
Yeah, yeah, it is a complex issue. But like, I totally get what you mean. I totally get what you mean. And it still pops in my head when the other time you were talking to me about like, isn't it better we have, you know, skinnier models on the <laughs> I, I see what you mean. Yeah, so I wasn't obviously <laughs> talking about anorexic people or anything like that, but obviously... Like the Victoria's Secret, that's what I was yeah, about, yeah, sorry. Yeah, good yeah. example. Yeah. Um, and, I th yeah, I think our, our fear of creating unhealthy body image, which is a, a valid concern, absolutely it is, uh, has to be outweighed by the affirmation of people who have chosen unhealthy ways of being. I think I think that's um, the lesser of two evils is, is to have a healthy ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and also on, on another different but I guess related topic, um, I've received a lot of positive feedback, uh, a lot of private messages uh, from people about the, the incel video mm. that I did. Uh, and... I think that's like that kind of relates to this as well. Uh, we need to make sure if you're a young man uh, that self improvement is is a message that has has been lost because what I what I think is happening in our in our culture with young men in particular instead of being taught that competition is is good and healthy mm -hmm. uh, that um, trying to you know that, that being masculine or, or trying to and when i say masculine i don't mean much i mean like the constant things that that are associated with masculinity you know um athleticism mm. exercise uh uh taking you know a, a moderate risks um mm. uh, constantly working to be the best at something yeah uh, and competing with others in that in that endeavor is entirely a good thing and what it's being replaced with is mm. this idea of like toxic masculinity which is a term that i don't actually think means anything uh mm. and it, it, instead of treating young men as i thought toxic masculinity was like they're scared of talking about their feelings like but then i think it's ex exacerbated to something completely different than i ever thought yeah and we can we can come back to that because i think that's an interesting uh, interesting counterpoint there but uh the the way I see it is that instead of treating young men like extraordinary latent potential, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 think about what the ideal of a male is supposed to be in the in the grandiose scheme of things. You know, heroic, protective, um, loyal, chivalrous, noble, just, um, mm -hmm. uh, even tempered, temperate. Uh, moderate. Um, the, these things are associated with all the the true silver virtues of the Roman tradition, right? Mm. And yet, instead, I think young men are being taught that they're latent sexual predators that need to be taught about consent. And, and, and I'm not saying these issues aren't important, but that's all I'm hearing from the media. I'm not hearing about oh, how, how will men actualize their true potential. It's more about oh, how do we prevent men from being the worst of the worst, right? And I don't, I don't think those messages mm. are helpful to men because men come and they like. There was this incident with a school mm. uh, in Australia, uh, an elite school where 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 all the men, all the boys, were required to stand up and, and apologize for violence against women at a societal level. None of them were in trouble for anything. They hadn't done anything. This was this was the boys apologizing to the girls for violence against women. Uh, and now the school apologized because the parents were outraged. You know, why is my son apologizing for something that he hasn't actually done or would never engage in himself? Yeah. Like, uh, would women do the same thing? Like, because it does happen the other way too. And, and you wouldn't expect women to get up and apologize for the actions of a few. I mean, that's just silly. Uh, and, and, but, the, but that's the point, right? It's indoctrinating young men in the sense that they're actually, you know, privileged oppressors mm. and and not people who suffer and sacrifice like the rest of us and i i i, I really want to see young men succeed mm. um and the incel thing is a contributing factor to that because i think some men are becoming disenfranchised you know they're not they're not being told to you know excel right mm. and be brave they're told to to just circumscribe those aspects of themselves that might be a little bit dangerous and the fact is men are a bit dangerous and and we have to appreciate that and actually celebrate that in a way mm. um so uh, 
importantly, if you're a guy who's struggling to find a partner, uh, please follow this advice. Number one, those aspects, write them down, those aspects of yourself that are the least attractive because you want to be the person you would want to date, right? Like you, you want- Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you want to, if you, if, if you want to attract someone that's special, okay, that, that actually would make you better, then you have to demonstrate yourself that you care enough about yourself to want to inspire them, right? So, so you know those things about you that are the least appealing, right? So write them down, make goals around them, and stick to those goals. And goal setting and achieving goals is actually one of those things that's quite attractive. Uh, and uh, because it means that you're a go-getter, you care, uh, you make an effort. Uh, and uh, also those aspects that you could be the, achieving in. Um, what you, and it doesn't matter what it is, right? And as long as you care about stuff and you're willing to put time and effort into it and demonstrate that the fact that you have sincerity, and that's going to be very appealing as well. And then, of course, most importantly, like I said, it's not most importantly, one of the important things is uh, put away the apps, go have a real interaction with women, find out where they are and, and go and spend time <laughs> in those social yeah. circles. <laughs> Uh, and and get it good advice from the from the women in your life as to what you should do. Uh, um, yeah, me and Charlene, there's on my back about drinking. Uh, yes. But there's uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, and uh, you know that's um and that's good. Uh, so that, that's that's what I hope. And and of course, obviously, um, you know, uh, just as with women, uh, being massively overweight as a guy is, is not attractive. Uh, the it is true, uh, certainly, that women, um, for you know, long-running biological reasons, uh, the, the emphasis placed on their appearance is much greater than for men. But even for men, obviously, being healthy, being athletic, mm. you know, going to the gym, getting lots of exercise is going to make you much more attractive. Also, dressing appropriately is going to make you attractive, uh, and uh, and put some thought into how you present. Uh, to other people mm. so that's the, that's the main thing and the the trends uh that are happening as i said in the video can largely be attributed to the way the apps work uh the unintended consequences of not having personal interactions reducing courtship down to electronic swipes in an impersonal way uh is is highly destructive um, both for women and for men. For men, because either they massively lose out uh, mm. because they just don't have the right profile, or uh, they become cynical because they have too much choice. And they and 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 men need to be romantic as well. Men men need to believe that w there are women out there who are really difficult to attain, um, but are worth it and are, and are good people, uh, and aren't out there, you know, searching for lots of guys. Um, mm. And thus, being matching with someone on, a, on an app, uh, particularly if you find lots of matches, mm. uh, is a real good way to reduce that aspiration. Mm. And for women themselves, uh, you want to, if you're all swiping the same guys and they've got the pick of 100 people, well, chances are they're going to date 100 people. Uh, so if you're actually looking for a serious relationship, um, you're far better off finding someone near you who who you meet with and and you can actually get to know and size them up appropriately, yeah. Um, rather than just someone who's really really good at presenting themselves in an electronic format. Mm. Um, so yeah, okay. for for those reasons, um, put those away. Work on yourself. Uh, fix those parts of you that you know you need to fix. Judge yourself not on where everyone else is, but on who you were yesterday. Uh, woo forward towards those goals. Get good advice from the women in your life and uh, meet people uh, where they're at in face-to-face, -face, person to person. So do that and life will be infinitely better for you uh, mm. than, than just going the, the way that the sheep are at the moment. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree, agree with that. I remember my auntie, like, when I, I told her about how I met my boyfriend on the app and my auntie were like, why are you so so quickly, La? Why did you go to this? Like, so I would have had a different boy in the morning, in the afternoon, and then in the evening. And I'm like, <laughs> that is so exhausting. <laughs> like, I can't. I would be emotionally exhausted personally. Like, that's the worst thing. But some people could do it. 
I wouldn't be able to. But I totally agree with that in the point of like, you know, you've got a wide selection of people and then, yeah, you date a hundred people. Like I remember when, yeah, we first started dating, I made him work. <laughs> I made him work, which actually comes to a point of like this whole um, movement of, you know, trying to put men to be masculine and um, be better people, right? better to build better men. How do women support men in that way? Because that's kind of a way, like I've been thinking about reflecting is like, I don't want to contribute to this movement of like anti-men like I want I actually do in like want masculine men around right I do believe there is a role for men and women like women are more nurturing I can see it <laughs> and men need to stand up <laughs> and I want to but most people because I've met some people are absolutely like pushovers <laughs> like and like how do I support these men to kind of we solved that problem in the Middle Ages. Like, <laughs> we, we, we actually we actually talk about uh, sort of just by er, early Christian Dark Age, Middle Age, uh, with a degree of denigration. Like it was a sort of a, a we were a childlike era, and that's not true. We were adults and, and mm -hmm. mature, just as we are today. Uh, and what we had was um, some incredible stories about how men and women are supposed to behave, right? And so, what women need, for example, is true demonstrations of sincerity because if if a guy isn't willing to sacrifice immensely for her mm. uh then she has no nothing else to base on his reliability or, or the fact that he his intentions are, are noble and just no. when, when you said you put him through hell and when you first met you got him constantly doing everything that that's a perfectly natural thing to do uh a good example is um I, I didn't put him through hell. I just made him work. Like, anyway. As in, like, being patient. Yeah, and that's... <laughs> like, I didn't jump into the dating straight away. I was like, look, let's just see how we go. Let's just, you know, enjoy dating. Like, dating without being... Or courting. That's what, courting. And both sexes need that. I, I remember, um, I might have told the story before, a couple of friends who got married. Oh, they're now married. But um, when uh, he first wanted to date her... Uh, I've, I've never seen a, a, a challenge posed as, as stark as this, but I think it's really mm. illustrative, which is she put three riddles, uh, wrote them down, yeah. and stuck them in three different books in the library oh, and gosh. didn't tell him which books they were. Uh, and so he had to... He, first, he started going through every book in the library, through every page, trying to find these riddles, Right. Uh, and then he wisened up a bit and was like, ah, oh, no, she's probably chosen specific books. So he went and did his research to find out what book she liked uh, and like the kind of authors she was into and stuff and then focused there. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of two months, right, he went through the library, got those three riddles, answered the riddles, and then they went on their first date. Like that is not, I know that sounds extreme and crazy, but that's kind of what a guy wants, right? He, <laughs> it is, I know, I like it because it, it if it, nothing that's worthwhile in life is easy, mm. right? If it was easy, everyone could do it. And no man wants a woman that everyone can have, right? Mm. So uh, she should make it difficult for him and he should demonstrate that he cares enough to work for it. Now, that might be a really traditional classic view of romance and so on, mm. but I genuinely think that's the best way uh, because that's... Uh, that's, I mean, compare that to the apps. Like, what option A, option B? <laughs> um, you know, one one seems easier, yeah, uh, and therefore it's going to be less less meaningful. Yeah, and I just speak about this all the time. Um, the one that would never would never see again. But like in movies, right? Like in mm. our media today, media culture, is we don't see them portray people meeting on apps. Like we see them still meeting in person. Like, why is our media still showing us traditional courtship? That's a mm. powerful question, and that's a really a really sharp observation. We don't see people meeting up uh, and getting into relationships on apps. You're hundred percent right about that uh, because our, it, our there's something about us that knows this, um, and that's why it's not reflected in the culture. I, I think people would be a lot less impressed by their on screen relationships if they yeah. happen to meet on an app and hooked up and you know stayed together the next day. Uh, it just wouldn't be as impressive um, to watch. People want that 
that discord and that that trial to overcome. Uh, and we shouldn't under I mean people criticize the the classic you know Arthurian legends who for saying for you know traditional women's roles and male roles and so on and uh, you know okay. But I'll give you I'll give you one story. I think it's uh, Sir Gawain who's who's thought of as the um uh, also Galahad. Uh, it's one of the two, Sir Gawain or Galahad. Uh, Galahad is thought of as the the perfect knight, the the, mm. the truly decent decent soul. Uh, and I think Gawain was like King Arthur's best buddy, right? Uh, anyway, one day uh, there's a there's a curse in, in Camelot in the land, and Arthur is scouring the solution, you know, because it's blighting the crops, it's it's causing all kinds of harm. And he finds a witch, and the witch says, Look, I can help you. I know what the problem is, and I will solve it for you. Mm. Um, but uh, there is a there's a price. And uh and he's like, What's the price? And I was like, Well, I need to I want the choice of who to marry in your kingdom, right? And uh, he's like, well, I, you know, I need to know who it is first. Uh, mm. And she says, oh, Sir Gawain. I want to marry Sir Gawain. And this witch was like, you know, a hideous crone, you know, boils everywhere, you know, really smelly. Uh, and Arthur's like, I don't feel right ordering Gawain to do this. So I'll go and chat to him about it. Mm. And he does. And Gawain's like, he's such a bro about it. He's like, is, it, is this, <laughs> is that it? You just want me to marry some woman? You're going to save the entire like flight, and you're going to cure this thing of you know this curse and everything. Of course, whatever you know, it's just nothing. Uh, and uh, so Arthur's like, okay, he's feeling really guilty about it. He's like, all right, um, such a bro. <laughs> uh, and he goes to the, the the witch, and sure enough, she essentially gives him the solution. Yeah. And he goes away and does it, and everything gets better. Uh, and even then, Arthur was like, oh, God, I don't know if I can force Gawain to go through with it but Gawain's like no 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 look we made this deal and and she kept her into the bargain um and she was a, a real pain about it as well she was like I want a public wedding everyone has to be there um and sure enough there was like a a whole you know carnival of festivities mm. for this massive wedding between this noble knight and this weird crone and everyone was pointing and laughing and making jokes um and they get married. Mm. They go to the wedding bed, right? And it's late at night. And instead of being this hideous witch, she turns into the, just the most glorious maiden that anyone had ever seen. And she says, look, I too have been cursed, Gawain. Uh, 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 and either I can be this way for you at night or I can be this way for you during the day when you're with other people, but it can't be both. Right, right. All right. So, you know, you tell me what you want. Now, what did Sir Gawain say? I think you've told me this story. Mm. Do I have to? I know the answer. Do you well, want... say it if I told you the story. Yeah. You choose. <laughs> choose, yeah. It's like that. there's a there's a deep nobility to this story, right? Um, and if you read into the kind of the, the mm. cultural essence of this, um, it, 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 there, is, there is a true sacrifice for both. Yeah. Um, so he demonstrates his nobility by keeping to the deal and not humiliating her in public and going through the wedding and doing all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to the option of having this beautiful maiden that everyone can see, um, uh, he decides, no, 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 my my popular reputation isn't as important as your happiness mm -hmm. um, unless I will relinquish that decision, which I think should truly be yours. Uh, this is not... A story of you know female enslavement uh, this is a medieval story mm. of women's empowerment uh but in the context of a traditional relationship role so mm. i just think that's just a truly beautiful thing and um, my hope is that uh, as you know men feel more comfortable being about uh, being men and and uh, mm. our society hopefully is a little bit more forgiving of of the masculine and the feminine in our culture Mm. Uh, that we tend to reconnect with these things that have served us well for so many generations. Yeah, mm. I mean, there's any all other practical things that like I could do just for like my male friends. I mean, I could like give them our video, but like I don't like know. And like and subscribe. Yeah, like and subscribe, join <laughs> <laughs> friends. No, but like in terms of just like day to day life, because I just feel 
I don't know. I just feel like they're so lost and it's kind of like I want to poke them without feeling like posing on their life. But I want to be like, be men. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, I think it's important to understand what got us here. For example, on the one hand, a lot of the norms that had been built up between men and women in our culture were just biological realities. Until the, the pill was invented, invariably, you know, a woman needed to get married in order to have a secure yeah. um, uh, way of, of having children, uh, uh, which is something that she was unable to realistically avoid other than becoming a nun or something. So a lot of that was just assumed um, because it was just like growing up or, or, you know, having a period or whatever, like it was just normal stuff. Whereas now, because we can control our biologies to such a degree um, and we've kind of misguided ourselves to think that, that biology is no longer a limitation. Now, that is not true. Biology still drives, you know, 95% of our lives. It's just that in the, when it comes to conception and, and, our, and our sexual reproduction, that is now under the control of people. And what is the, it's caused problems for both sexes. For women, as I've said in previous videos, they're delaying having children to the point where fertility becomes a genuine concern. Um, and at that point, it's difficult for them to find you know, compatible partners and they have to make adjustments in terms of their expectations and, and who they see. Um, and then for boys, it's extending their adolescence mm. to indefinite periods of time. Uh, the whole concept of adolescence is actually quite recent. Uh, Right through the 1800s and, and the, much of um, uh, the 1900s, uh, adolescence wasn't even a word. It was like you were a child and and uh, and then you were an adult. Um, and then there was like a, you know, age of, of coming of age rituals and things like that that would yeah. transform you from one to the other. And then if you go back even further, you were just sort of treated like a young adult, even from birth. You, mm. you obviously didn't have the experience or the strength or the maturity. But there was no clear distinction between being a child and being an adult. It might have been, you know, uh, sexual maturity was pretty much it. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so this whole concept of a, of a period of time where you find your identity uh, as, as like a, a, a specific goal in and of itself where you're no longer the mirror image of your parents, you're rebelling against them, uh, and you're growing into the person that you will one day be, well, that is no longer... 13 to 21, which was the kind of constructed period of time uh, mm -hmm. for, for previous decades. Now it goes on forever until such time as a guy settles down and has children of his own, right? If you're, if you're living a bachelor lifestyle, uh, you very seldom do men have these external constraints on them that force a level of maturity, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it is personally driven. The other, the other thing is that there is a, a strong movement, particularly on the internet, that's become deeply cynical about uh, marriage and relationships in terms of its deal for men. And, and this, to, to, to the extent that I think the kind of the misogyny argument might have a foothold, I wouldn't use such a, a, a pejorative term, but what I would say is cynicism. There's a cynicism about... Uh, whether or not being married is a good thing for a man, okay? Because you, you get married, you have children, you work like constantly to provide for those children and to, and you don't have much time to yourself. Yeah. Uh, and then if you get divorced down the line, she'll invariably get the children and, and most of your, your physical wealth. Uh, and then the life prognosis of a divorced man in any Western culture is extremely poor, right? Most men who have been divorced suffer bad life outcomes so uh, a lot of men are just like well, why would i why would i get engaged in any of that none of this is good for me uh and i think that's you know as i said as a romantic I, i'm actually disappointed with that i love marriage i think that's a wonderful institution even though i'm unmarried it's one of the reasons i am unmarried because i like that institute um and uh i think for for boys um what you can do uh, is a, as a friend and as someone who can see them is is help them realize that time is not unlimited mm. uh, because we're caught in this this adolescent period 
I think one of the reasons that people have become cynical about marriage is that it's self-interested to delay it further and further and further. Yeah. And because men don't have the same biological uh, realities as women, they, yeah. they literally can. They can delay it for as long as need be. Yeah. Um, uh, but at a tremendous personal cost uh, because they're not becoming the person they actually could be, mm. which is, you know, provider, protector, um, mm. guide, stalwart, you know, all the things that, that people want in a man. Um, mm. So, okay. yeah, I mean, just that would be that would be the message. Be like, okay, remind, ask them clearly, ideally three years from now, and don't like a, I think a three year time scale is probably a good one. Yeah. Um, three years from now, where would you like to be? What would you like to have in your life? In each in each category, like uh, you know your your um, professional life, mm. study, travel, relationships, family. Yeah. And and have them like talk about what they're doing mm. to advance those goals because it's we live in a world of unlimited choice, oh, yeah, endless absolutely. distractions absolutely able to kill time like if you want to kill a day just anything you want to do right um and that's just what guys do because they don't have the the fire lit under them to settle down and to shape up and to do those things uh because we have a world of endless choice it's so easy not to address those things that are uncomfortable right Mm. that we know we want to do but Mm. we just don't do yeah um so procrastination is the norm, not not the escape. Yeah, um, and so yeah, th- those are the kinds of things that I would advise. Is just just remind them that that the person that they want to be won't get there by themselves. But there are structures you can put in place to to help achieve those goals. Yeah. Um, okay, that's good to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If they ever watch this video, yeah, they know which one I'm wishing. <laughs> Like, what's the time scale? <laughs> Let's say three years. <laughs> three years is a good one. Three, three years is long enough. Yeah, it's enough. realistic. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's long enough for meaningful change to have occurred, mm. but not so long that it becomes something that you can just endlessly put off. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, yeah, so I think I think that's a good point. Mm. Mm. Okay, cool. Oh, and just before this, we were watching or oh, on our journey to like culture Charlene, we were watching Pulp Fiction. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, because of the, the stuff ups in the weeks in review, um, there's a few movies we've gotten through now that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about. So well, of course we, we watched Terminator 2, which we we did talk about. Yeah. Great um, movie. The fifth element was just like some comic oh, relief. I just didn't understand the comedy of the fifth element. It's but... not as good as as the others. Um and, <laughs> But it did. It, it was a good abject lesson in being like, okay, well, what's the what's the standard I need to pitch out with Charlene? And, and I'm very pleased to say, wow, at a higher standard. It is high. I I I, I can show her confronting films as long as they're good films. Um, so last week we watched Silence of the Lambs, mm. which powerful performances between the relevant, you know, protagonists, uh, Anthony Hopkins. Uh, I, I in the last. You know, now aborted episode. I went on a long explanation as to the evolution of the psychopath in popular culture. Yeah. So pre Anthony Hopkins's uh, Hannibal, it was uh, back in the mid nineteen seventies. You had uh, Andrew Robinson's uh, performance in Dirty Harry, playing the the villain who liked killing for its own sake. Mm. Which before that wasn't really a thing. People wanted to kill for money or revenge or, or power. Power. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the way we understood it. The idea that violence itself could be attractive seemed somewhat foreign in our in our films mm. uh, until that first Dirty Harry film. And then it was um, when in at the same time in real life as that Dirty Harry film came out, there were breakthroughs in forensic psychology where. Uh, they're like, okay, well, if we actually sit down and interview all these serial killers that mm-hmm. we have in jail, we might actually get an understanding of their drives and motivations and yeah. predict their behaviour. Uh, and there's a fantastic television show that's come out called Mind Hunters that, that explores that in a, in a fairly faithful way, I have to say. So uh, go ahead and watch that show if, if you can sort of stomach that sort of thing. Um, and and the apex of that was displayed in in Hannibal the mm. the psychiatrist who knew about yeah. human psychology right was a was a celebrated expert in the field but also a killer himself mm. and his intense relationship uh with Clarice 
Mm -hmm. uh, powerful stuff. So that that was a, a great movement. Yeah. The song. scariest thing about Hannibal is that he is creepy, but he's polite, and you don't you don't see him kill anybody or eat anybody until like three quarters into the film. Mm. So you're like, you're like, I'm meant to be scared of this person, but I like him. <laughs> Yeah, that is a that's a scary <laughs> villain. <laughs> yeah, he's he's, an, he's he's quite incredible. Mm. Uh, and uh, and then we've just watched Pulp Fiction. Yes, uh, which is an extraordinary. So there there are a number of things that I really love about Pulp Fiction. We haven't actually talked about it because we've only just watched it. Uh, one thing I, I love, first of all, it's creative, right? It, mm. It's got multiple stories happening at the same time. They're happening out of order. But, and yet they do link up. And if you do, you know, watch it, like I think on the second viewing and you, and you know the yeah, way things are going to fall, yeah. who's who, that it all kind of flows really, really well. And every single character has an interesting arc mm -hmm. and every single character is a hero of that movie. So uh, yeah. it, it, everyone can have a favourite character and it's basically totally legitimate, or whichever character you pick, because they're all valuable in their own right. The dialogue is extremely theatric uh so mm -hmm. every single conversation um it can be a cult conversation whether it's like you know whether or not you give someone a foot massage is that sexual or not i mean that's that was a powerful conversation right <laughs> at the front of the film um, so know, would you give your a foot massage oh i mean that was he, he scored 100 points there didn't he Did you give me uh, <laughs> this is like it's yeah, like, shut up, I'm man. Really, I'm really tired. Man. I could really, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's an extraordinarily powerful thing, and then and then the whole way that the the rumors started, like this was all based on something that wasn't even true, right? You mm. know, and and it gets revealed in the context of the conversation with the wife, yeah, uh, and uh, and just little things like um, you know the differences between Europe and the United States and Amsterdam, mm. uh, and. Uh, the I wolf. really liked the interaction. What was the couple? Uh, we're talking the little a few. Asian couple and like the other Asian. I can't remember. No. So we're talking Bruce Willis's Butch and oh uh, yeah, Butch. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love their interaction. Yeah. The reason why is because it reminds me of my relationship of how I would, especially when they woke, he woke up and like he just pushed him out of the bed. I was like, that's exactly what I'd do. Like, it's so relatable. I was like, wow, these are based on real people. Oh, of course. Like, that, that, uh, so, so that, that fierce thing. So, and, and look, if we're going to be truthful, we've all, we've all pretty much done this, right? Where there might be something really important you've told her. And you're like, okay, this is the important bit of information. <laughs> and it'll be the one thing that she stuffs up, right? And so you lose your shit for a few seconds and then she gets upset that you've lost your shit and you're like, no, you shouldn't lose your... And this is a really male-female thing. The guy's like, okay, I shouldn't be losing my cool ever, let alone with my partner. Yeah. Uh, and therefore he's like, no, it's not your fault. It's my fault because this is my responsibility. I can't blame you for it. Uh, I didn't relay to you how important this was. All I did was say this. And then when he's in the car, he's like, I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's it, it's a very you you watch her and oh. every conversation keeps you engaged. Um, it, you know, of course, at the end of the film, where where um, uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character it, 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 Jules is going through the transitional phase, <laughs> and it's just like it's all happened pretty much. It was almost killed, and he's like, okay, well, normally I would just kill these two people, and this would be over. Um, but I'm trying, and Vincent, who's just like, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so every single one of these characters is is really special, and, and the film is is quite believable in the characterization. Yeah. They felt like brothers, man, when they were interacting, Samuel Jackson and um, yeah. Oh Vincent, yeah, like, like when they're at Jimmy's house in the bathroom, and and he's like <sighs> trying to explain this is a friend, and, yeah. and 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 he's like, and he screams at him for like getting the the. <laughs> the the hair towel towel and, yeah. and blood is like this is the crap that's going to bring to my head. Oh, and they're in the car. And the car, they clean the car. <laughs> that's exactly like, why am I in the back? <laughs> <laughs> so they're obviously close, and I think um, oh. uh, and, and Vincent clearly needed Jules as a as a bit of a foil, and, and yeah. the fact that Jules moves on is one of the reasons that leads to Vincent's death earlier in the film. But uh, but he's still alive at the end. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, the and then and, and the wife, 
brilliant a brilliant kind of gangster's wife character like i could totally believe that mm. um a, a sort of a, a a derivation of michelle pfeiffer in scarface a film that charlene hasn't seen we we might graduate to that one day um but that's you know next level um but uh pulp fiction yeah really great film and uh and one that has just the most cult lines uh, mm. that has been passed down to us now obviously there's a lot more smoking in that film oh than my god used to. It made me a song console. i'm like stop smoking like i'm so happy that the new video doesn't have smoking in it but yeah i mean like you can tell they're all addicted <laughs> yeah well they used to get a lot of money from the tobacco companies <laughs> wouldn't uh, be surprised uh because they want to see their stars on screen puffing away i mean that that's the thank you for smoking movie uh that that kind of derivation of that as well where uh, um, they want to reintroduce that into the, the, the plot of that film. I mean, there's a lot of subplots, of course, but the main plot is they want to reintroduce smoking into cinema, yeah. um, so they can get make smoking cool again. Uh, and so, what they decide to do is create like a, a new sci-fi movie because they think, well, that's more easy to do because it's in the future and it's like people could be smoking and people aren't going to be complaining all the time because they'll be in space and they're like, well, who the hell knows what's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but yeah, back in the day, back in the nineties, smoking was just absolutely normal on screen. Yeah, and inside too. Oh, like yeah, yeah, in the restaurants and in the houses. Yeah, I, I commented on the dancing. I was like, Crispin, is that how they dance back then? Thank goodness there was a born dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was that actually is a funny dance, but it was. I think it was good for and, for the for the vibe that they were going for there. And a lot of drugs too. A lot of drugs. A lot mm. of drugs. And and. The 90s was also like a serious epidemic of drugs in the United States, particularly um, crack and, and heroin. And, and yeah, it was all, all, all the great drug movies came out during the 90s. So you, mm. you had Train Spotting, Human Traffic, uh, Requiem for a Dream, uh, the, these, these iconic drug films. So drug use in, in movies um, has really died off. Uh, quite a bit now. I don't know if that's deliberate. Whether that's because they just don't want drugs to be shown in film as much. Maybe it, I, I, I do think it's. I don't think it's socially driven. I think it's commercially driven because in the United States, um, things like swearing and drug use give things a much higher rating than they do here in Australia. Like in Australia, for example, uh, we have the same rating system similar to what's in the United States. But what will give a, a film an R rating mm. will be a combination of things, and it's normally sex that's the thing that does it. Mm. Whereas uh, in America, it's it's language, which mm. is bizarre from an Australian point of view because we're all pretty colourful here, uh, and uh, and drug use. Mm. Um, so I think drugs have really gone off the boiler yeah. because um, they don't want to have the R rating because the R rating makes it very inaccessible to general audiences. Uh, right. A lot of a lot of people in the US won't go see an R rated film. That's why it was such a big deal. Um, what uh, was Pulp Fiction rated? Oh, R. Uh, Oh, sure, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We saw everything that happened. There was rape. There was, um, you know, murder. There was drug use. There was cleaning up the body of the car. Uh, <laughs> there was there was a lot of swearing. Um, yeah. And so, but of course, you know, the, but but here's the thing: it's a different era, right? Because although it had an R rating, um, a lot of younger people watched mm. it. It was also seen as a sort of a coming of age film, like one of those films you would watch when you were trying to grow mm. up because there was so much going on. Yeah, yeah, uh, and. We we do see that uh, to a, you know, for for example today, if you're going to give something an R rating, all the actors have to pay take a massive pay cut. So um, mm-hmm. the the most famous recent example of this was Logan, the um uh, the the old man Logan film for the X Men. I don't know if you've seen the Hugh Jackman. Okay, so uh, the la- so so Hugh Jackman has played X Men in seventeen films. Mm. Okay. Hugh Jackman will always be the iconic Wolverine. Yeah, right? of course. And then Logan was the send-off for that character. Now, it was a powerful, moving, traumatic film, very different to all the films mm. that um, had come before it, which were all, you know, PG action, hack and slash. Films. Yeah, of course. This was like, you know, a, a pathos film. Yeah. Uh, but it had an R rating, and uh, rightly so. Um, but... In order, to, but that was the deal that Hugh Jackman made. He says, "I'll do the film if it has an R rating, and I'll take whatever money you offer me because the R rating is going to make so much less for the cinema mm. uh, and for the company." Now, of course, 
because Logan turned out to be incredible. Mm. Uh, it was also extremely successful. Everyone mm. wanted to go see it. Uh, and thus, you know, even though it had an R rating, it was successful. But in the US, most R rated films are, are break even in the prizes at best. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's why we don't get good art. Again, like, I'm, again, it's one I- of the reasons. It's one of the reasons. The main, the main reason is just um, everything's a remake now. The, yeah, the, of but course. Like, like major, major comp. There's two, there's three reasons R rating. Um, but the biggest reason is the fact that that huge investment in it's these commercial films, machine. 150 million, 200 million dollar films. They don't want to gamble that money. They want to. They want to go with something that everybody knows and can instantly recognise as a crowd pleaser. Yeah, trolls, um, trolls too. <laughs> exactly, all the new Star Wars and, and everything. So they'll just recycle the same beats and and drag out the nostalgia yeah. in an effort to get a certain amount of money across the line. And then the third reason is is current cultural identity politics with uh, with various uh, uh, major film studios trying to push particular agenda uh mm. yeah pulp fiction does not push i mean look at all the all the n words they use oh yeah in that film and not just like you know black guys saying it to black guys but white guys saying it to black guys like, black guys saying it to white guys uh, that would not fly no no you could in, like if you, if, you, if you show that script to someone today they'll be like ha, ha, goodbye uh Canceled. So, <laughs> yeah yeah but but i mean this was you know, Quentin Tarantino doing a cameo uh, as he often does, mm. swearing that off the black of his face, right? Um, you know, constantly throughout throughout his his ten minutes of of footage, mm. uh, because he's angry that that Jules has driven this car up with this dead guy in it. Mm. So um, I'm sure there's been apologies made. Oh, uh, no. Well, Quentin Tarantino would never apologise, I think. That's actually one thing I like about him. But I haven't... Now, I'm really embarrassed to say this. I haven't seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is his latest film, mm. uh, which has just come out like a year and a half ago, right? So I should have definitely seen it by now. And it has been recommended to me, um, which is about... Uh, and it stars Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt, right? So both both actors that were absolute icons in the 90s right zenith of their popularity okay yeah uh and uh, the, the, it it stars those two and one, and one plays the the star and the other one plays like that other person's stunt double or something mm. so they've been working together for decades yeah and the whole movie is about how the film industry has changed right that, that, that they are now in the twilight of their career and they don't really understand like the way all these decisions are now made. Mm. Uh, now, I haven't seen the film. I'm told it's excellent, and I think that this will be a... And for someone like Quentin Tarantino, I think this would be a real criticism. The other thing about Quentin Tarantino that's really interesting is that he um, he is a massive fan of Australian cinema. So many of the shots that you see... So, for example, that that car um, where he hits Marcellus Wallace, Marcellus flies onto the windscreen, the milkshake goes yeah, everywhere, yeah, yeah, yeah. goes crashes into the thing... These are all Australian style shots, right? Uh, there's uh, uh, and and he, he, Quentin Tarantino has done these documentaries on Australian film. He's like, yeah. oh, look, you know, this shot here where they do this with the Kingswood going through the billboard. Uh, like, he's really keen on the way that the, the Australians do things because we because back in the day, in the seventies and eighties, in particular, yeah. um, Australian movies were fantastic and and. One of the reasons for that is we didn't have any experts. Like we didn't have anyone telling us there were these rules that we could break. So a lot of these things were made up and invented. <laughs> we're like, let's do that. Yeah, it sounds good, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then they would do it, and it would work. Which is why Mad Max Fury Road, right, which yeah. is a recent um, uh, film, mm. but made by an Australian filmmaker, uh, is the best, easily the best action flick in in the last twenty years. Because just every single shot is just awesome right you're mm-hmm. watching it and there's a there's a strong visual impact and quentin tarantino is big on that he's big on music impact he's big on dialogue and he's big on the visuals uh mm-hmm. and he delivers those pretty strongly so uh, mm-hmm. quentin tarantino one of the all-time great writers and directors yeah. um uh, i think famously he had a huge thing for uma thurman which is why she stars in a lot of his films but uh but i think she wasn't interested like, that's what i've heard i've made <laughs> um and uh, uh, yeah, she plays the wife of Marcellus Walls, but she also stars in Kill Bill Volume One and Two. Yeah, is uh, that the next movie? What, what's our next movie? Wow, what is going to be the next oh, movie? Well, I, w- I would have said The Matrix, but you've seen that. Yeah, uh, because I saw of, that in school. 
Yeah, what, I, what I've been trying to do is, is stagger it. So one kind of thriller, hard to watch film, one kind of more lighthearted. Now, Pulp Fiction has a lot of things in it, but it is more lighthearted. Mm. Uh, so maybe the next one is seven uh, or um, I'll have a think. I will, I'll find what the next one is. Seven would be a pretty tough one to watch. Mm. Um yeah, no. The, the usual suspects, maybe. I don't know. I'll have. I'll have a think. Yeah, yeah. So far, so good. I feel like there's a lot of movies I haven't seen, or a lot of good movies I haven't seen, and they are leaving a lasting impression. I'm like, wow, I didn't realize characters could be written this way. Um, yeah, yeah some of them have story arcs. <laughs> wow, and a storyline and a message like uh, <laughs> something that challenges you. Well, that's amazing. Oh, oh, is there any um last final thoughts? Yeah. Uh, final thoughts. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, as I said in in the uh, sort of a obesity video, uh, I have made a commitment to lose what was it, ten kilos? Was that the was that the effort? I think that was the the mark within three months. Um, so that's doable. Doable. Okay. Is it? Where, I'm where? I'm not sure. Like I could never lose like. I then I don't know how much I've got to lose, but yeah. Well, like you know, so 10, 10 kilos in three months, which will take us to, uh, so May, June, July. So so by by mid year basically, mm. um, to have lost that weight, uh, which means yeah, not much drinking, and oh, Charlene's so happy. <laughs> uh, and uh, and very careful calorie counting um, for mm. the diet. I mean, the problem the problem for me in drinking it has not been. There's been two problems. One uh, is that it really, like, as I get older, it just writes me off the next day and often for the day after that, where, you know, anything I had planned to do, any poor activity is often out the you door. You mean you can't brush up and wake up at 8 a.m. and bounce? <laughs> yeah, not like I could when I was, like, 18, for sure. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, and so that's really, really difficult because I often have a lot of things I want to do. Um, and also uh, simply that... that when I'm am recovering, mm. particularly in those couple of day period, I'm eating a lot of calories and comfort food to try and purge myself of of the drama. So, like mm. you say with the kebab, um, mm. so it's actually I like it. although 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 the alcohol itself, I'm sure has like real calorie problems. My problems is the consumption of calories in the, mm. in the next couple of days afterwards, as I'm trying to physically recover. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's not worth it in in that in that level but i don't think i'll ever be a full abstainer i'll be an abstainer for much of the period of which i'm trying to get to this goal yeah um because it'll help get me over the line mm. uh, but no i think a, a you know a gin and, and soda water um is is really good i don't know it's, yeah no yeah. for sure for sure yeah. i think it's important yeah have a goal aim towards it and like you said like see how well you go and mm. if you execute awesome and then you just Make sure you just don't have a lot of it. <laughs> don't yeah. drink. And, and, and I'll be honest about the results, by the way, guys. Like uh, the, you'll see it, obviously. You know, it's, it's, it'll it'll be a the camera doesn't lie. The camera, <laughs> the camera is is fairly brutal. So <laughs> that friends um, episode where they have like his Monica is like, look, a, a camera adds ten pounds, and then like Chandler's like, how many cameras are on you? <laughs> 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 so, camera doesn't lie. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah. So yourself, final thoughts. My final thoughts. I got the jab, jab. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Yeah. So I actually had the vaccine, which I got the AstraZeneca first mm -hmm. dose. And my goodness, they don't tell you what the uh, side effects are. Like, well, they do tell you, but they don't tell you the extent because I was basically out for the the day after. So I had it, what, um, Thursday, Arvo, and then Friday I was completely gone. So I literally woke up sweating and hot, and but then cold at the same time. It was just not a good look. I, I wasn't out of bed to 2, 2 p.m., like physically out of bed, and even then I was only up for like a few hours to eat, and then I went back to bed. So, yeah, it like the side effects was pretty... Sorry, just cut out. Side effects were horrendous? Yeah, so, yeah, the side effects were pretty horrendous. Like, for me, anyways, like my... What's it called? The system. 
my brain stopped working. Immune system? Yes, my immune system was like all time high. I was like, like up. Like I was just like, what is going on? And I literally spent like the entire day on my phone, like Googling, like, is this normal? Like, am I like going through something or like, am I reacting really badly? And apparently it's completely normal. Um, and because the efficacy is so high for these vaccines, they've only just been tested as safe and all that kind of thing. So maybe, I don't know. I don't know. But like, I was like, okay. I literally had to weigh to myself. So, okay, get COVID or feel this. Get COVID for this. <laughs> like, I was like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, man, reflects on that video about, you know, the, like the ethics of people getting forced to have the vaccine. I'm like, absolutely. There should be ethic ethics around, you know, you should have rights to your own body. Because if I knew uh, had I felt this way, I don't know. But the day after, I was bouncing and, around. And honestly, and I think I think that's deliberate, and I have to be careful what I say here. But I think there is the, the when I when I look at the news stories that I see on this subject, it's all oh, it's perfectly safe. There's no evidence of any problems. Oh, oh yes, there are issues. Yes, but but they're like fragmentarily remote. You should definitely go out and do it. It's fine. Uh, and Okay, I think I think you know being vaccinated is good. Inoculated mm. against a dangerous disease is good, but I think they're really overly petrified of non-compliance. If they're actually frank and, and yeah, open, yeah, they're just open about it and like told me you know take a Panadol, do this because I took a I ended up taking a Panadol and just you know like followed what my mum said was good, <laughs> and then I was fine. But like I was not prepared. Like I really wasn't prepared. And I had had I not say that was my first vaccine ever like i probably would have distrust against vaccines mm. this is the first reaction i've ever had to a vaccine i trust vaccine i know the science but man i was petrified that that, that day like it was just crazy and okay. i so now that you've gone through it um because most people haven't been vaccinated yet in australia uh, <laughs> I well, in australia including in the world i mean most people in, in the uk have been and and most people in israel have been but most places in the world are still being rolled out mm. uh, so what advice would you give to people who are about to get one like what, what should they do to, to minimise the impact? To minimise the impact. Like we don't know how your body is going to react, right? I, I, this is just conjecture. Like I think as a young person, like your immune system responds to me a lot quicker than older people. So it's going to be a lot more intense. So that's why I'm talking to my social circle, people who have gotten a similar age. Um, so take the day off work. So do it. Yeah. Don't plan anything the immediate day after or two days to be safe. Um, and literally just rest. Take a Panadol. Like if you get here to take a panel immediately, I took two and then at the end and then before you go to bed, take two again and you'll feel, I felt right, like upright and went to the gym straight after that. I was like, I'm ready to go. My health. Oh my gosh, I got it back. Yeah. But So yeah. of course this isn't, you know, we're not prof giving professional medical advice. Oh yeah, absolutely based on, not. on our own uh, experience. Yeah. M equals one. So yeah, yeah. take lots of water like, and try to eat something. If you can't, you can't. Mm. But like rest, like rest, rest, rest. Like, my body was aching and it was just like, it was just a crazy experience. Like I was, yeah. And again, I had to reach out to people who had to, you know, took the vaccine as well. I was like, well, did you experience it? Like, yeah, I did. And I was like, well, why, how did I know? <laughs> like, Cause I had to cancel some plans, man. Like, mm. But yeah, anyway, absolutely. but it's okay. I got the jab jab. I can't wait. I'm one step ahead of Crispin. That means I can go travel. Like, <laughs> well, you need, you need your second one first. That's true. And yeah, unfortunately, uh, my my access to it will be more restricted for down the line. Our rollout in Australia is is embarrassingly it's slow. Really slow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I definitely want to go travel. Uh, but yeah, well done, Charlene, on, on having that experience and you can share, yeah. share knowledge. Well, there's two, right? So there's AstraZeneca and then there's Visor. And apparently, the Visor like side effects come on the second dose. But I don't know. Like, it will depend. But either yeah. way, like there is, yeah. To so, any vaccine, right? Because so, yeah, Charlene's second isn't for, like, three months, is it? Yeah, but they recommend that because they said that the latency will improve the effectiveness. I don't know the science. Yeah, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Just just so we will, we, when you do get the second one down the line, we will touch back with how that went as well. Uh, yeah. Because maybe I will have had the first one by then. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty slow. Yeah. yeah. But, oh, well. Anyway, uh, any questions, any feedback, please leave them down below. Um, otherwise, please stay safe. And, yeah, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.